Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. What a great, what a great crowd. Uh, welcome to the Indiana Landmark Center. My name is Marsh Davis. I'm president of Indiana Landmarks, and I'm so pleased to welcome you to this, this great crowd. We've got hundreds of people here and even way more watching us through Zoom. So thank you for being here. Our program tonight is What Really Happened on Indiana Avenue, A Story Untold. Our program um, is presented by Indiana Landmarks Black Heritage Preservation Program and our friends at Reclaim Indiana Avenue. To tell the story of Indiana Avenue, we're honored to have a group of highly distinguished panelists moderated by Indiana Landmarks board member, the wonderful Alelia Bundles. You know it's going to be a good program. The importance of, of the avenue and its story and, and its future is borne out by the amazing attendance this evening. We are, this is a sold out crowd. And again, there are hundreds more joining us um, remotely. I'd be remiss if not mentioning uh, that Indiana Landmarks is a membership organization. Our work around the state and our Black Heritage Preservation Program depend on support from our members. If you are a member of Indiana Landmarks, uh, we thank you very much. If, if you're not, please consider joining us. Membership information is available in the lobby, of course, on our, our website. Our business at Indiana Landmarks uh, is historic places. I honestly cannot think of another place in Indiana more steeped in history and culture and community than Indiana Avenue. Tonight's reflections on its past, we sincerely hope, will help inform the future of Indiana Avenue and those entrusted with shaping that future. Now to get things start, started, uh, please welcome my esteemed colleague, the director of Indiana Landmarks Black Heritage Preservation Program, Eunice Trotter. Good evening, good evening, everybody. Thank you for all being here, uh, both in person and virtually. We had over 1,000 registrations for uh, tonight's discussion. As uh, director of Indiana Landmarks Black Heritage Preservation Program, my job is to uncover document and preserve Black history and Black heritage statewide. And that preservation work extends to not only things that have physical evidence, buildings, churches, cemeteries, but also things where there has been erasure and there has been significant erasure of Black heritage. Funded by Lilly Endowment, the National Trust, and the Winstons, this program, which has been in existence for a little bit more than a year, has provided more than a quarter of a million dollars in grant funding for the preservation of Black heritage sites and history statewide. Partnering uh, for this event tonight with BHPP, the Black Heritage Preservation Program, is uh, Reclaim Indiana Avenue. Um, please stand Paula Brooks, who leads the organization, which has worked tirelessly to represent the interests of Indiana Avenue area residents. So Paula, raise your hand in the air, Paula. Should... <clears throat> Also working uh, to plan this event is Judy Ransom Lewis. She's the daughter of Willard Mike Ransom and the granddaughter of F.B. Ransom, who was a key player in the building of the Walker, which is now a national landmark. Thank you, Judy. Where are you, Judy? Stand up, wave your hand wherever you are, Judy. <laughs> And uh, the other part of our team in organizing this event tonight is Charles Blair. Where are you, Charles? Raise your hand. We're going to tell you more about Charles in a minute. <laughs> so my job is to just recognize and acknowledge all of the help that we've had 
in this work. Uh, so I need to thank a number of sponsors. Um, and I don't uh, know who all is here from those sponsoring organizations. Maybe you can raise your hand when I call your name, but Indiana Humanities. I know George Hanlon is here. Also, uh, Dr. Lucia Spears and Jay Major's Charitable Fund. I know that Claudia, who is the sister of Lucia Spears, is here. Uh, Purdue University. Purdue University folks. I know there's a few folks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Also, the Urban Legacy Lands Initiative, Uli, uh, was definitely a sponsor. The Indianapolis, where are we at? Anybody here from Uli? The Indianapolis Urban League, the Episcopal Diocese, the Episcopal Diocese of Indianapolis, PNC Bank and IUPUI Africana Studies Department. Thank you. So thank you also to Indian Landmark staff and volunteers. We have a number of staff and volunteers who have helped us organize this event. They have and are continuing tonight working very hard to make this event happen. Thank you all very much. Also, thanks to our wonderful moderator, Alilia Bundles, and our esteemed panelists who you will hear more about soon. Thank you, Alilia. She has been the best moderator person I have had to work with, so I thank you for that. I also want to acknowledge uh, EKLA e e e -A Studio principals who came here from New York, and I haven't had a chance to meet you. Are you here tonight? EKLA are um, part of the firm that is doing the strategic planning for Indiana Avenue. There, oh, there they are. Okay, thank you for being here. They flew in from New York to be here too, by the way, everybody. So today is uh, the first day of Black History Month. So please go to our gallery in the basement down on the floor below to see the wonderful Black Art Exhibit by Insight Art Promotion. And I would be remiss if I did not direct your attention to other upcoming events. You'll see them uh, promoted on the screen, but they include uh, the Freetown Village uh, BHPP Black History Classes, a discussion about Black labor issues that the Kurt Vonnegut Museum and Library is co-sponsoring, along with the Indiana Remembrance Coalition. I saw Julia Whitehead here too somewhere. Where are you at, Julia? Where are you? Okay, there she is. Okay. And then we're also going to be showing the film Reviving the West Baden Colored Church. These are all organizations and events that are seeking to preserve that heritage. And then watch for information about our Juneteenth celebration, which will be held Sunday, June 16th, highlighting some of the top gospel and blues artists in Indiana. So if you're interested in being a sponsor, please let me know. Now, we have lots of ground to cover, so I want to hurry up and bring on stage Charles Blair. So as Charles comes, I will talk to you a little bit about who Charles Blair is. Charles, um, as a senior program officer for Lilly Endowment, um, was responsible for developing numerous initiatives, including the creation of the Madam Walker Urban Life Center, which was organized by Charles to save and renovate the world famous Walker building designed by Robish and Hunter with guidance from Madam Walker's daughter. Charles also oversaw the 1987 Pan Am Games Youth Outreach, which uh, resulted in some of the most significant youth programs in the city, including the Indianapolis Children's Choir. Charles has worked extensively in minority economic development, education, and civic engagement. He also advised and led the capital campaign for Martin University. Uh, Charles is also my friend, and uh, we worked together at the Indianapolis Recorder, which uh, I owned for some years. And he is an all around nice guy, ladies and gentlemen. I am bringing you Charles Blair.
Well, I don't know how to uh, even respond. This is such a wonderful evening. Uh, many of you are my friends, people I've worked with in the past, and this panel up here is exceptional. And I'll say one thing very, very quickly. There's no way to cover all of what happened uh, in an hour or so that we have tonight. So we're gonna do our best, but hopefully we can continue this conversation. I'm born and raised here. I was born in Indianapolis, of course, in 1947. <laughs> Not 1847, or something. And at that time, some of you know, Black people hardly could be born in hospitals. I think my generation was one of the first generations that was born in a hospital. All my mother's family was born in, in the house. She had 16 brothers and sisters. They were all born at home. So you can see, what I'm, my point is, we're talking about an evolution, a, a, a span of time, a reality that was there. It has nothing to do with anybody being negative about anything. It's just life. I grew up here. I knew nothing about the Walker Building. Absolutely, not. I'd been there a couple of times as I grew up, but it had faded pretty pretty quickly by the time uh, we grew up in the 60s and the 70s. But the key was, uh, years after that, I was kind of sitting on my couch, literally came from New Jersey. I'd been working in the prison system out there, helping inmates learn how to read, Rahway Prison, where Reuben Hurricane Carter was and some other, it was a terrible, terrible, place, terrible experience, but I met some wonderful people, but I couldn't stay. I stayed for a year and had to leave. I came back to Indianapolis, got a call from a man named Dick Ristine, Richard O. Ristine, one of the best people I have ever met in any place in any time. He was a wise, kind, generous man. He called me, and I was sitting on my couch because I hadn't, hadn't, I just moved back to Indianapolis, didn't have a job, and the phone rang. He said, here's Charles Brown. I said, yeah. He said, I'm Dick Ristine. I'd like for you to come in and talk to me at the Lillian Endowment. Never heard of Lillian Endowment. None of you had probably heard of it in those days because it was very quiet. I think there were two or three people there. And I said, okay, I'll go. I went in. I walked into the building. Jim knows this well. Mr. Lilly, picture bigger, bigger than that. J.K. Lilly, Colonel Lilly, just your white man. I'm walking in. I got, a, I got an afro. You see the kids now. <laughs> playing basketball, all you talk about, say, oh, why are they wearing their hair like that? Well, I walked in with this afro. I saw these three giants. I said, oh, I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> I, was like, oh, I had one suit. But anyway, to make a long story even longer, Gene Beasley, who was chairman of the endowment, used to sell pharmaceuticals in Elyria, Ohio. Anybody know about Elyria, Ohio? Lorraine, Ohio, Oberlin, Ohio. I went to school in Oberlin, Ohio. Mr. Beasley knew all of the places. I was scared. I was talking to this who I knew was a great man, and I was intimidated. He started talking about Lorraine and Illyria. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, we went over there. And I went over. He said, oh, he's hired. And Dick Christine hired me and as an assistant. And over the years, I started out as a program assistant and worked up to be a senior program officer and eventually a program director. And over those years, uh, my friends here, Jim in particular, and also uh, Kenny, were with me on this Walker project. How did it start? We did a program called uh, Minority Education Leadership Program, I think at the endowment. We had people come in to talk about what to do in the community. One of the things that came out, and sadly, the person who bought this up to me is no longer with us, is Bob Ransom. Bob Ransom just died recently. He was one of the, of course, the descendants of F.B. Ransom, the fam Ransom family, the Bundles family, all those folks that had done, the Walker family had done so much for the Walker building and the Walker company. But he came to me and said, Charles, what about restoring the Walker Theater? I said, uh, you know, I, I don't know. To make a, another point, Jim Morris at that time, of course, was the head of the, what was called the Indianapolis Program. That has a lot to do with everything that's happened here in this town, including what's happened with the historic landmarks. And he can talk more about that if he chooses. But the point is, he'll never, never do it. He's too modest. But he has had a lot to do with what's happened in a positive way in the city of Indianapolis. He's one of my favorite all-time people, and he always will be. Jim, I just have to tell you that. The other thing I have to tell you, <laughs> digressing a bit, from Eunice, uh, Bill Bays and I, and I was Bill's partner, a lot of people don't know that, we purchased the recorder from Eunice Trotter. 
Eunice Trotter saved the recorder, not Bill Mays. I want that clear. I just have to make a point of emphasis. I just wanted to say that because she came in, she taught me what to do for, the, for a month or so, uh, several weeks she was there. I think she was longer, I think it was longer than a month. I can't remember Eunice, but she taught me all the ropes because I knew nothing about a newspaper. And we turned that into uh, the, the recorder as we know it now today and the years that I was there. Let me just show you one quick thing about the recorder that people didn't like while I was there. And uh, pretty, pretty, you'll be able to tell. You ever seen one like that? It's blue. I changed the color and everybody got mad at me. Uh, but it walking worked and we increased the, we increased the circulation tremendously while we were doing that. But I just wanted to mention Eunice's role in this. But Bob came to me with the idea, the idea of doing the walker and to make the long story even better, we took a busload of people from Lily Endowment to the walker, walker building. The Walker building at the time, the plaster was falling down, the walls had fallen down, there was rain everywhere in the, in the ballroom. The ballroom floor had the warps in it that tall. You couldn't walk, the entire staff of the endowment went to the, went to the Walker Theater. And based on that, I started to formulate a plan to restore this building, to save this building. I wrote up the articles of incorporation eventually, which were performed by uh, uh, Norm Tabler at Baker and Daniels. He did the art actual articles of incorporation. I wrote it up, and the one thing I want to say in particular, in addition to all the people who helped, that I'll get to a little bit later, is that the main emphasis for the restoration of Walker was minority economic development. How does that work? Well, we said when we do business, we're going to do business with black companies as much as we can, and we did it. The man who built the theater, who created, who restored the theater, is a man named Jimmy Beard. I don't know if Jimmy's here. No, he's not. Jimmy Beard did such a great job on the Walker Theater. Michael Browning, who you might be all know from being, of course, Mike Browning Investments, told me that there was no way that he could have done that work for the cost that we paid him. He paid, he did an exceptional job, a wonderful job. He's never been mentioned. Jimmy Beard has almost never been mentioned. And from that point of view, he built his business, he built his family, he sent his kids to school. The whole idea of minority economic development is for people to do, to grow, develop, and create things. And that's what we were about. That's what the Walker's intent was from the beginning. Now, somewhere along the line, I think people have forgotten the economic development aspect of it. I don't know how much businesses the Walker does with minorities. The other thing that Ken Warren will talk about later on is something we called BOSS. We created another entity to buy a property and manage properties to support the Walker Theater. He can talk more about that later. But my point is simple. These were dreams. I had no idea we could do any of this stuff. I had the support of people like Jim and Penny, uh, Aaliyah, Henry Bundles, Mike Ransom. Mike Ransom was the key to this. He came to me with, at the endowment. We sat down and worked out a way we could save this building. We finally found $300,000 from the endowment to purchase the building from the Walker Company. The Walker Company and the Madam Walker Urban Life Center, the only two entities that have ever owned the Walker Building. The board that I set up and chose was primarily African-American, but it was from all walks of life. Henry was on the board, Henry Bunzels. Dr. Taylor, Joe Taylor was the chairman. We did some wonderful things with that board and we were able to save the building and it's still there, as you know, to this day. The last thing I want to say before uh, before Aaliyah comes up is simple. I think for nonprofits, and this is something that I've worked with for many, many years, the board of directors can make or break, create, destroy, uh, do wonderful things or do terrible things. And so the board of directors owns any nonprofit. That's as close to an owner as they'll be. And if the board of directors of any organization wants to change something or stop something or start something, they have the absolute right to do it. The projects we started at the Walker were somewhat finished, but when we left, Kenny and I and others, somehow the board decided to do other things. And that was up to them. They had the right to do it. I don't particularly agree with it, but I think, again, you need to know some of the background. And hopefully as, as time goes by tonight, you'll be able to get some more information from the folks who are up here. And I can tell you they know, they know what happened. 
Thanks a lot. So as Eunice said, an all around nice guy. Um, and I owe you a debt of gratitude and the Lilly Endowment. I mean, just the fact that the building is still there uh, and that it's a beautiful building. But yes, a lot of dreams that were thought about, you know, haven't happened. And that's part of what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, I thank you all. I thank the planning committee, uh, Indiana Landmarks. I, it's a joy to be on the board because of all of the great work that Indiana Landmarks is doing. And it's a joy to work with Eunice. Where's Eunice? I said, did she sneak out? Oh, there you are. There she is. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to all of you who are here with us tonight in person and virtually. I, I just have to say, wow, a thousand people registered. And who said that history isn't interesting and can't draw a crowd? We care about this topic. We care about what happens on Indiana Avenue and in Indianapolis. And this really is a historic gathering and quite a coup to have Charles and these particular panelists on the same stage together. To borrow a line from Hamilton, these are the people who were in the room. Ken Morgan, the first executive, yes, applause. <laughs> the first executive director of what was then called the Madam Walker Urban Life Center and the former president of BOSS, Business Opportunity Systems. Jim Morris, former president of the Lilly Endowment and now vice chairman of Pacers Sports and Entertainment. Joe Slash, former president of the Indianapolis Urban League and former deputy mayor of the city of Indianapolis. Faye Williams, an attorney, a civil rights activist, and as I learned last week and during our conversations, a former social worker in the Indianapolis public schools, and I will also say the wearer of the most fantastic cowboy boots I have ever seen. You know, and... and As I listened to them share their personal experiences during our planning meeting, I realized just how much of the Indiana Avenue story is not known, has not been told, and is in danger of being lost. There are dozens of stories, dozens of perspectives, dozens of interpretations, dozens of players, and many, many competing interests. Before we get started, let me share some numbers that were compiled by Jordan Ryan the current city county archivist who worked closely with the late Paul Mullins on some of his important Indiana Avenue history research. And if you haven't gone to the digital encyclopedia of Indianapolis, please read Paul's entry on Indiana Avenue. For perspective, I think it's important to know that what happened with the construction of I-65, I-70, the IUPUI campus, the IU Medical Center, and downtown Indianapolis redevelopment are all intertwined. So consider this, more than 17,000 people were displaced by the construction of I-65, I-70, and the IUPUI campus. More than 8,000 Indianapolis homes, businesses, and other buildings were demolished. 29 churches were raised and 11 others left to wither even, and eventually closed because of the isolation and barriers around them. 320 acres in and near downtown Indianapolis were condemned for the new highway system. And a key caveat from Jordan, these numbers came from a newspaper from newspaper accounts of the time and are believed to be significantly understated. She is working on the digitization of photographs from the archives of the Indianapolis Preservation Commission that will show exactly what was lost and what was demolished. The collateral damage to communities and families continues to this day. What I hope we can do this evening is begin to shine a light on this untold and inspiring and amazing story. We are only going to be able to scratch the surface. The truth is this panel could really do 
a week-long conference, but you are going to have a joy in being able to hear them. Because we can't do everything tonight, here's what we're going to focus on so we can take advantage of the collective wisdom on the stage. What was actually happening in the neighborhood in the 1960s and 1970s from their individual perspectives? What were the outcomes they wanted to see happen when redevelopment began? What were the obstacles and what were the failures and the unintended consequences? What were the successes and the positives? And what would they have done differently if they could go back in time? So let's get started. Okay, am I on? Oh, excellent, excellent. So we're going, I'm, we're going to start with a question for everybody and I will start at this end with Ken. Ken calls me Lily, I call him Kenny. So if that slips out, that's, you know, that'll happen. So please share your memory of Indiana Avenue, the 60s and 70s. I mean, you actually lived on Indiana Avenue for a while, but I would just love to have you help us have some context of what was going on on the cusp of the changes. Well, <clears throat> I lived on uh, Fiat, Fiat Street um, for a while and uh, went to school four and school 40 in the neighborhood. Uh, my first job, was selling recorders on Indiana Avenue. Um, one of the finest remembered is, is the Walker Building. And that's for a lot of us recognizing what the Walker Building was. Uh, I remember going to the movies there, uh, walking by the beauty shop. Uh, but I remember the, the training the, the Walker uh, School that trained uh, uh, beauticians. Uh, my mother was a beautician. My sister there, they are graduates from Matter Walker's Beauty School. Um, it was such a, a wonderful experience to walk down Indian Avenue and see the variety of all the different black owned businesses. It was something that inspired us because there were so many instances in Indianapolis that we saw what we didn't have. But when we came to Indiana Avenue, we had community. It wasn't just community for the people who lived there. It was a community for all African-Americans. That was home, that was our community. That was where we were inspired by what we saw, examples of what we could do. You know, I remember the businesses, the florist on Indian Avenue, and the restaurants. My favorite was Scotty's. They had the best hamburgers in Indianapolis. All the different restaurants. I remember the clothing stores. When we were in high school, no blue jeans, no tennis shoes. We wore Stacy Adams, we wore the best clothes, and we shopped on Indiana Avenue at Fogel's and Matus. <laughs> I remember um, Arlene's record shop. <laughs> yeah, I remember the Frederick Douglass, the nightclub we used to go to when all the other nightclubs closed. <laughs> um, but it was, it was so many different, different businesses. And then Lockfield Gardens. You know, I had family lived in Lockfield Gardens. Remember playing on the Dust Bowls, basketball. Uh, George McGinnis, some of the greats that played basketball. That's where they, Oscar Robertson. You know, the greats, that's where they came from. You know, Lockfield. So it was so much to remember and so much that we want to not only remember, but help to do what we can, while we can, to continue to build and increase the legacy that we have. And then um, I started uh, working in the area uh, as, as the director of the Madam Walker Urban Life Center and then as president of the boss. Um, and I worked both of them at the, at the same time. And uh, it was such an excitement 
about what could happen, but great obstacles that we had to deal with and, 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 and different uh, elements that were impediments to trying to do what we felt like we could do. But I thank the Lord for the opportunity that he gave me to live in that area, work in that area, and to work with all the distinguished people on this panel and many who are in the audience. Thank you, Kenny. And what I didn't mention in Kenny's introduction is that after he left Indianapolis, he became a preacher. So, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you were doing that before, but that's, <laughs> but thank you. Thank you. Um, so Jim, what was, what was your memory of Indiana Avenue as the Lilly Endowment was getting involved? I'm very happy to be here. Um, I, I don't have um, the same historical reference that Kenny does. I do remember Kenny as a great, great basketball player for <laughs> Indiana University um, and Wood High School. And as genuinely a good guy. Um, I I was Dick Luger's chief of staff when he was mayor. He was 32 and I was 24. Um, a few years later when he had gone to the Senate, I said, Dick, don't you wish we could go back and do it again, knowing then what we know now? And he said, no, Jim, I don't feel that way at all. <laughs> um, it's funnier than you responded. Um, <laughs> the um, and a key issue in the campaign in 1967 when he was elected, um, Father Boniface Hardin who was the pastor at Holy Angels and Boniface throughout his life was my close, close pal. Great man, good man. But the issue of should 65, the interstate coming into the city, be below grade or above grade. And it was a very contentious issue. Um, I remember, um, Two things, I, the, the controversy around the future of Lockfield Gardens. It was one of the, if not the, but one of the very first public housing projects in the United States. And the historical significance of it, um, how to honor that and how to save it. Secondly, I remember uh, going to events at the Walker Building. Um, oddly enough, you, you, uh, the Republican Party used to have um, a lot of events at the Walker. And there was a great judge by the name of Rufus Kuykendall um, who used to host uh, all sorts of activities uh, for the Republican Party in the community at the, in the ballroom. And um, I have fond memories of attending those when I maybe was 25 years old or, or so. But uh, my, my interest in this subject, um, I, I want to amplify what Charles said about Dick Ristine, this extraordinary man um, who, brought our attention to what he called the Northwest Quadrant. And that led to the endowment being interested in a whole range of opportunities in the Northwest Quadrant. I, I was involved a little bit in, when I worked for the mayor. I was involved in the rebuilding the market that had been burned down. We, we built 
something called our market. Um, so I was I was then involved. I was chairman of the Health and Hospital Corporation for eight years in Wishart Hospital there. Um, then I, I went to the endowment. Was there 16 years, and then I had also been involved with Indiana University uh, substantially over the years. So I, I touched the area from those four different perspectives, and uh, we we had um, thinking of all of the assets, and we can talk a little more about that later in our conversation. There is no place in downtown Indianapolis, maybe in the city, that has a greater panorama of assets than the northwest quadrant of our city. And the opportunity to take advantage of that and make the most of all those opportunities that were, um, were there was extraordinary. I, I, as I listened to Lily, I um, feel the pain and understand there may have been some uh, insensitivity to what has transpired there. I'm sorry about that. Um, but I want to talk a little bit tonight about the opportunities that are in that area. And they are beyond extraordinary. And um, I do remember Jimmy Beard, and I do remember the endowment's commitment to, the endowment's an extraordinary place, by the way, founded in 1937 by the two brothers and their father. Um, they would have preferred to do all that they did in complete anonymity. They never ever wanted the attention or their credit. They wanted to make a difference in the quality of life for every single citizen in Indianapolis and in our state had an enormous commitment to the development of church life, not in an evangelical way, but in a way of making the quality of re the religious spiritual experience better, stronger, more effective, regardless of um, what the denomination was. The endowment had an enormous commitment to uh, private education, and an enormous commitment to the historically black colleges in the United States. The Lilly Endowment has been the single largest supporter of historically black colleges in our country for years and years and years. And their, their commitment to do the right thing, to make life better, to be inclusive, falling short like we all fall short from now now and then, but um, the commitment to the Northwest Quadrant to redo the Walker Building, to save it because of its historical significance to the broader community, to the African-American community, and to do it right. And, and they, by the way, they've sustained that commitment now for, you know, for more than 40 years. So, um, my my wife says, Jim, you ramble on. Um, <laughs> and she also says, you ramble on without regard to the subject. Um, but Jim, we needed to hear yeah, the good, about that. We the did. good news is my wife is not with us tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and she will not know my shortcomings or transgressions <laughs> un unless you let me down. But I, I look forward to coming back and and thinking about what is there in that part of our community, unbelievable and what the opportunity is, you know, with, with all of the problems of uh, the university, 
Today, I can tell you that more than 300,000 people have received degrees from that university, and nearly all of them have stayed in the state of Indiana. Um, that's really quite remarkable. And with the separation of IU and Purdue, we are going to have two incredible world-class universities in the heart of our downtown that belongs to everyone. So forgive me. But, but did I tell you we had the people who were in the room, 24 years yeah. old, chief of staff? Yeah. But, and, and the Lilly Endowment has made such an incredible difference. I mean, obviously those of you who know me know that my dad was um, head of Center for Leadership Development. And that's really how I got to know Jim because they were such very good friends and the support that came. And the Walker Building would not still be open were it not for the Lilly Endowment, but that is true of so many things in the, in the community. So we're going to, and we are going to talk about the opportunities. And you know, one of the things Jim, Jim is, uh, has lived a life of service. And when we talked on the phone, um, he really is very interested in seeing the possibilities for the future. And that's what we're really going to end the evening with. Joe Slash, how did you, what are your memories when you first arrived in Indianapolis in 1966? Wow. <laughs> um, many of you probably don't know, I um, came here as a Army officer stationed at Fort Benjamin Harrison, um, administrative officer and instructor at the um, adjutant school, adjutant general school, where we taught uh, new officers. We also trained all of the postal workers in the Army, the um, data processing at the time, the army recruiters, so forth and so on. But I officially became a resident here in 1968. My wife and I bought a house on Graceland Avenue in Butler Tarkington. And we rented a house on Berkeley Road while I was in the, at Fort Harrison. So I felt I was part of the community um, knew a little bit about what was going on. My neighbor across the street was uh, J. Michael Smith, um, who uh, became great friends and fraternity brother. But he got involved and got me involved with the NAACP. And back in late 60s, 69, 70, somewhere in there. And of course, involved in a lot of the meetings with um, what was going on with the avenue. Then I took a job with Arthur Young and Company, which uh, international public accounting firm that's now part of um, Ernst and Young, now known as EY. And my managing partner there had come down here from Chicago where he had been on the board with the Urban League. And he got me involved with the Urban League here. It's a fairly new organization. They, one of our founders and um, so it was with those two organizations, I got a little bit more involved with knowing them what was going on at the, um, on Indiana Avenue. But um, it was mentioned earlier about Paul Mullins, a uh, professor of anthropology at IUPUI. He wrote that paper, um, Indiana Avenue and American, African American Hub. It's on the, um, website at the uh, Indianapolis Digital Encyclopedia. I encourage you all to look at this document. You'll find some amazing things in it. I was on the steering committee that put this together and we decided early on we couldn't put it in print because it would be obsolete by the time it came out from the press. It is a living document. And uh, I know that I uh, encouraged, I talked to Lucia and Jay and asked them to look at this section. Um, there's a little box down on the bottom of every page or in every section of that. And you can um, offer comments that our screening committee will review from time to time and decide what, uh, with the staff's input, we'll decide what needs to be added to these different segments. And particularly Indiana Avenue, we knew there was a lot of missing pieces. That's why I encourage people to look at it, comment. Um, but Paul, I, I bring this up because Paul's paper ends about where I got involved. 
and I saw some opportunity for some comments that I'm going to put together and suggest that we add to that. Um, but in, in the uh, time that I got uh, arrived here and got involved, um, late 60s, early 70s, a couple of clubs were still active on the avenue. I actually went to several of them, enjoyed the music. Um, then I remember Jim, when we put our market down there, people were complaining they didn't have anywhere to shop. And with the help of the endowment, the market was built. I shopped there whenever I could. And uh, then we come to the Walker. Uh, Kenny and Charles were actively involved. Um, about the time I got a little bit more involved on the city side of it, uh, Jim, you became chief of staff at 24. I think I was 35 <laughs> when I got that job because Dave Frick didn't want it anymore. But uh, while I was at the uh, accounting firm, we were engaged to um, oversee an audit of federal funds coming into the city and, and later to make sure our city wasn't going bankrupt. They had a project that engaged us to convert the city from cash to accrual accounting, and I was a manager put on that suicide mission. But we got it done. We made sure our city was uh, fiscally stable. But I, I say that to say that um, as I got a little bit more informed, and I think is the word I would use about what was going on in the Northwest Quadrant of downtown, specifically Indiana Avenue. And there were tensions uh, between the city administration, the black community and um, the university in particular. Some people felt that the university was using scare tactics to scare our property owner, our black property owners in the um, Avenue area to sell their property and get out while you can. And people were selling their properties at under what they could have gotten if they had waited and had some uh, better representation, I should say, to help them negotiate those uh, property sales. So fast forward when I became deputy mayor, first black deputy mayor of the city and their mayor, Hutnut. We have now had a mayor who, like Luger, believed in equal opportunity. And Bill had a message for the um, community, particularly for the suburbs. But Bill believed in a strong, vibrant downtown and inner city, and he wanted to work to make sure that not only did we get the inner city redeveloped properly, that we had um, black participation in the economic development parts of it. We wanted to make sure that the wealth was being spread. We actually got an ordinance through our city council that required 25% or better participation in these projects. Or I forget the percentage of uh, black employment on these projects if we didn't have black ownership participating. And of course, there was a job that fell on the, on my lap was to make sure that we we honored that, and I uh, felt good that we were able to do it. But Bill also had a message for the suburbs. You know, he said, "You can't be a suburb of nothing. You've got to reinvest in the core." of the city and don't get mad when you see us spending dollars to make sure that the infrastructure of the core of our city is properly maintained and that included the Indiana Avenue area. So my new role was to uh, oversee some of the projects in the uh, Indiana Avenue area. And this was one of the main thing was uh, after we and talk to Kenny and Charles and some others. I think Ravenel Fields and Floyd Stone, some community leaders I uh, remembered, uh, Gene Spears. But we, we 
he felt that we had to immediately get a roof on the Walker Theater. Otherwise, uh, as Charles explained, it was going to fall in. But we also had the same dilemma with um, the old Indiana Theater downtown, where the Indianapolis uh, Repertory Theater was moving into. And I was a member of that board before I went into mayor's office. Um, and I knew what problem they were facing with the theater. And so uh, with the help of uh, Senator Luger, we were able to get a meeting with the uh, Secretary of uh, Housing and Urban Development, HUD, and, and, and were able to get grants to help us get the roof on the Madam Walker Theater building and the Indiana roof. Uh, also, uh, in order to make the, the compromise that was reached with Lockfield Gardens was that um, we, would, we would only be able to tear down a third of it, restore what we could with the uh, one third of the old building. And Jim, you can help me out later on this, but um, I have to explain to people one of the reasons the Lockfield couldn't be totally rehabilitated for uh, low-income housing like it was, was uh, HUD had new standards for their public housing apartments. And the way Lockfield was built with a lot of concrete and steel, it just could not make it. We couldn't upgrade it. But it would be suitable for student housing. And so well, the third piece of what we were asking for from uh, HUD was to get a uh, historic preservation grant uh, to help us with um, what we could do with the uh, Lockfield property. And so with that, um, we were able to get that done. Walker was saved, Lockfield was saved. Not everybody was happy, of course, because we had some members of our community who still felt like we would get the screw because our people were being forced out of houses so the university could expand. But uh, be that as it may, I don't know if I were here earlier how anything else might have been changed, but um, it is what it is. And I had to work with what I was given to work with at the time and felt like we did get those things done. Thank you so much, Joe. And that's why it's so important for us to hear these stories so, Faye, I, I can't wait to hear from you. Let me let me just say, I've moderated a lot of panels, and I, you know, and I kind of outlined things, and I said we're going to have three minutes for this first answer. And, you know, I knew it wasn't going to really be three minutes, but everything that all of you have said has been important and necessary to hear. So that just means I will, instead of, you know, my seven questions, we're really only going to be able to do two more. So, oh, but, but, want, but no, you, but no, you're, you're coming with Faye. Okay. And you're Faye, warning me that I'm No, 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 I'm, no, no, I'm not, not warning you. Because, you know, okay. but, you know, three you know, three you know no, no, Faye, I can, uh, Faye, there is, no, there is no warning that I can give to Faye that will have any impact. So I just, I just want you to, understand that okay. um but uh one of the you know say when you know, i've known Faye sort of a, around for a long time but one of the things that as i said that stuck out for me as everybody is giving their memories of what they knew how involved they were you know some people have stories now about the avenue and what they remember and they just kind of you know quietly said well i was a social worker at school four and I knew the neighborhood. I was going to the homes. And so, Faye, you bring a perspective that nobody else does, in addition to all of your activism. Mm -hmm. So, go forth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I am forewarned. <laughs> That's yours. Thank you. <clears throat> My introduction to Indiana Avenue happened three weeks after I arrived in Indianapolis in March of 1955. I went to work for a company called the R.L. Polk Company, who had the contract to develop and publish 
the city directory. And being new to the city and not really knowing a lot about it, I welcomed the opportunity to go to what I had heard about was a fun place to be. <laughs> so I started at the R.L. Poe Company with a little booklet that had all of the addresses in business from Senate Avenue, where the avenue started, to the 10th Street, where then General Hospital was. It was an experience and a great learning for me because what I learned was not always good news. Indiana Avenue was part of a neighborhood where a number of people lived. There was a section called the Bottoms. How many of you have yep. heard of the Bottoms? Yep, I remember it. Okay, the Bottoms was that very poor section with all the little shotgun houses where people were renters. The other places that was there is there was a real class divide, I would say. California Street and Blake Street were what I would call the more middle class, educated, professional Black community. School, when I went up and down the street trying to get information, I had to distinguish between ownership and rental. I discovered that most of the restaurants and taverns were not owned by the people who operated them. They did not own the land. They were on leases or another form of thing that I learned about contract buying. People bought houses and businesses and buildings that were on contract. And what that meant as a contract buyer, you had no legal rights. It was not registered with the city. The land stayed in the name of the persons who you bought it from until you paid it off. And years later, in my social work practice, before going to law school, I would talk to people who I knew 15 years before, and they had paid off the contract, but it had never been registered. So technically, they were not owners of the property. The other thing that I learned a lot during my period of going door to door is that it was the financing system, which I knew very little about, but quickly learned that most of the banks in Indianapolis did not lend money or have mortgage money to certain areas of the city. That is not uncommon in any city that we go to at that stage of the game. Uh, I moved to Indianapolis from Houston, Texas. That's why I wear these boots, you see. I'm, I'm a Texan, okay. <laughs> okay. And the one thing that I found different here in this city as different from Houston, where I moved from here, is that the land ownership policies were very different. 
and it did not have the same variety of banking institutions. Most of the banks were family owned. Mm -hmm. When I met Jim, he worked for AFNB. Is that right? Okay. The Frenzels, the Kennys, and the people who were in charge of the financial good health of the community were a very small but tight-knit group. As I walked up and down the streets of that area, I soon learned who the real owners were. Uh, Kenny mentioned the clothing stores. That was Fogel's. Okay. They were owners of the land and the stores and the only market available in terms of credit market available as well as jobs was in that business area. I was shocked coming from down south to up south. <laughs> Go ahead, I the same thing. <laughs> that the department stores had no salespeople of color. And even though there were no signs like I had experienced in Texas, colored white, the social practices very much called for these things. And Indiana, the section around Indiana Avenue were important in terms of both the economic, social, and cultural life. The businesses that were there, which were totally black owned and controlled, Anybody remember Jacob's Funeral Home? Mm -hmm. Yep. People's Funeral Home. Mm -hmm. Willis Funeral Home. Yep. <laughs> they were the people who bailed out a lot of the people. You know, they didn't turn people away because they didn't have insurance. And a lot of the families that I do depended upon the Jacobs, the Willis's, who ran those businesses. The other philanthropists and entrepreneurs were the Ferguson brothers. Mm -hmm. They were supposedly known to be gamblers but they also owned the best nightclub around and a number of times the police would raid the Ferguson Enterprises because too many white people mm -hmm. were coming. And there are many stories in the paper when you go back and see it is. There was a police chief named Morrison who said that it was not in the best interest of the city to have all the race mixing that was going on on Indiana Avenue. Right. And so, I mean, Faye, I will just say one of the things that I was reading is that we have this romanticism about jazz on the avenue. Yeah. But that was also going on. So I just let me let, me let you make one more point because we actually have eight more minutes before questions okay. and then I'm going to give okay, everybody. That's fine. Okay. I was warned. Okay. <laughs> but did we not we needed to hear all of that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, if you have there's a saying 
that I remember from my college days as taking a class in what we then called Negro history at Texas Southern University, one of those HBCUs which got money from the Lilly and Down says, if the house is to be set in order, one cannot start with the present. One must start to study and understand the past. That's from John Hope Franklin, one Thank of my you. favorite historians. Thank you very much, Faye, all of that. That's why we need, this is like, should be part one. We need a week. We need an oral history. This must happen. So we have eight minutes. So that means kind of a minute and a half for each of you. And I'm going to ask you, and we are also going to get questions from the audience. So you'll be able to get um, to answer some other things. But since we are not doing our 15 questions, we can, if each of you would kind of do a closing statement, either on what you would have done differently or what you see as the opportunities. Can I make a uh, deviation? From mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. But <laughs> a minute. But you have a minute and a half. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 I want us to. I want us to have a, a understanding of what was accomplished, and a lot of it came from Charles, Jim, and a lot of other people. But one of the things was the restoration, you know, of, of the Walker Building, and, and we're more familiar with that, uh, with the funding from the Lillian Diamond and other people. But there were some other things that were done. It was done in an in a extremely difficult time because there was no market for new residents moving in and new commercial development. So it was, it was difficult to prime the pump to try to revitalize that area. So the Madam Walker Urban License started a process and built uh, Walker Plaza. Walker Plaza on the parking lot of the Walker Building. And that was to increase African-American participation, businesses, but it was also to, to generate revenue so that the Walker Building would not always have to be dependent on the Lilly Endowment and others to give there would be a, res a revenue stream that could perpetually benefit. So by the grace of God, that was done. A partnership with Michael Brandon, Browning and uh, the Walker Building. The other was more difficult. That was the development of 500 Place. 500 Place was an office building on the prime site on Indian Avenue. It was on Indian Avenue in the canal. It was a partnership between Boss, the Madam Walker Urban Life Center, and Medic, the neighborhood organization. And it was to support all of those organizations with future revenue as owners. These were the owners of the building, but it was also to generate more African-American participation. So there was a black dentist who, who, who located her business on the canal in that office, in that office building. Um, it was a tremendous problem trying to get financing because at that time the, the interest rates were 18% and all of the downtown housing and, and, and real estate development had stopped. But by the grace of God, we had a partnership that provided the money, the Lilly Endowment, LIS, uh, a number of other agencies and that building was built, it's there now. It was listed as one of the 10 best buildings that LIS had funded during their 10 year anniversary. And so Kenny, you know, Kenny, I do not want to cut you off, but we really do have like okay. three minutes. Okay. So. And, and, I knew this was, I knew this was, I was going to have to be the traffic okay. cop. So, and I, and I just want to end with some of the people, Oscar Robinson's construction let me, company let me was one of the contractors on that building. And you can ask more questions. Jim, you talked about the opportunities, what you saw on Indiana Avenue. Just give us some inspiration on what you think could happen, what you see as the opportunities. <clears throat> I guess I'd rather listen to Kenny. Um, <laughs> well, you know, that's, you know. I, I know, I'm, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm only partially kid kidding. Um, we, we've seen 
Massav take off. We've seen uh, Fountain Square take off. Um, I, I can remember when Indianapolis didn't have a single hotel. I can remember when we had hardly any restaurants. Today, there are 81,500 people employed in the hospitality entertainment industry in downtown central Indiana. Um, USA Today said Indianapolis was the number one convention city in America. Whether that's right or wrong, that's what they said. When, when you look at the dynamism of our downtown, and, and I, I do believe the next five years can be the, the greatest in our city's history. Uh, with Elanco coming downtown, with the expansion of the convention center, with the new amphitheater in the White River State Park, the expansion of the zoo, the two great, I mean, you can't do better than IU and Purdue with all their shortcomings, but they're both committed to building a world-class institution in the heart of our downtown, a university that hopefully will belong to everyone, bringing all the strengths they have with a focus on research and development and a focus on the well-being of young people, opportunities for kids, the new CLD Center. CLD has helped 50,000 kids since it was started by Henry Bundles. I mean, it's it's on Martin Luther King Boulevard, not so far from the Northwest Quadrant. Um, the, the list goes NCAA headquartered, the high school federation headquartered, a new arena going to be built on the campus for IU Indianapolis athletics, um, the incredible development of IU health, uh, extraordinary actually, and, and none of that would be there, by the way, without the leadership of Frank Lloyd a good many years ago. Um, th this is an extraordinary environment. The Historical Society, the new state library being built on the canal, um, and the list, you know, the new Phoenix Theater. We have the potential to do something incredible, and, and we need to think big. We need to think about our legacy, what we have to build on. Uh, my hope that this would become one of the great music centers in the country with a great emphasis on gospel music and but the, uh, the, we need to bring our our best brain power and we need to form the partnership that kenny was talking about with and the, you know this is a city that has done a better job with partnerships than most places and um the lily endowment is extraordinary but without people, without Kenny and Charles and uh, Alili and her family and Henry, it, it wouldn't have happened. So um, I, I'm excited about the future. Um, you know, the mall is going to be redone. The convention business is just exploding. The new Martin Luther King Park at 19th and Park, the mayor has committed five and a half million dollars to make that as magnificent as any facility in Washington, D.C. Um, the housing boom downtown. Okay, Jim. Uh, yeah. yeah. But we hit this. That's why we yeah. need part two. But I will tell you, when I came in this afternoon and I saw the basketball floor that's been recreated in the airport, if you haven't been in the airport, this is popping. This city is popping. So. By the way, the. Uh, <laughs> the NBA All-Star Game will have a $360 million economic impact on our city, will be broadcast to 200 countries around the world, 3,500 media will come here, and this all fits together. 
So he's still in the room. So we, you know, Joe and Jim, you said it, Jim, you said it, but you didn't say it. The opportunity for Indiana Avenue is to become the next Massachusetts Avenue in this city. That's what the opportunity is. And we just got to make sure we get our piece of pie. Yes. Now, Ken said something that can't be overlooked. Yeah. Right. Because it's Cause we got to new the opportunity. But Ken said something that uh, is very important. It was a chicken and egg concept of what comes first housing or business development. We couldn't get people downtown because we had nowhere to live. The real estate developers weren't going to build anymore downtown because there's no place to shop. A friend, Richard Blankenbaker, who served me in the city as public safety director, raised a meeting with Joe O'Malley, who owned o O'Malley Stores. And we were able, John Krauss and I were in that meeting with him, and we were able to convince Joe to commit to a store in the old Sears building if we gave it to him rent-free for a number of years <laughs> and the city would make the improvements, then he agreed to take a chance to put a grocery store in downtown. That's what it took to trigger the real estate developers to commit to housing downtown. And if we're not for that, we'd still be having that conversation about economic development on Indiana Avenue. Right. But, but it takes got a will, great opportunity and that's, and that's what we need. Yeah. Okay. My concern is that we spend so much time talking about physical development and not human development. <laughs> I am concerned because I do not see the kind of effort going into helping our young people prepare for a future with the technological advancements which we need for them to participate in. So, and as some people have been saying, and what is the future of Indiana Avenue? There can be incubators. There should exactly. be. It's exactly. not just you know jazz clubs. It really should be about economic development. All right. So this has been. I'm. I've just learned a whole lot tonight. I learned so much as we were planning. I hope that you all have learned something new. Um, and we're going to go to questions. If you've written, I guess cards have been handed out. Well, you need a microphone because we're taping. So you, so it, it, if you can give me the, the question because there are there, there are people who are watching, so. All right, let me let me just grab this first question. You want to hand it to me? Great, thank you very much. Okay. All right. <laughs> when did the riots of the 60s take place on Indiana Avenue? <laughs> 1968. But we didn't really, you know, we didn't really have riots like a lot of places. It was <laughs> yes, we did. Mm-hmm. Okay, go for it. 1968, I was young. I was also at a period of time worked in model cities. And what before that? And as I got out of college, there was a man named John Lands. You, you heard about our, our market. Our market was what John, our market was a brand new supermarket on Indiana Avenue. And nobody's mentioned it, <laughs> well, it was mentioned, but it's not explained. And John had created this idea that he was going to help economic development on the avenue. And of course he did that. And he died. He was also the person who led the most uh, resistance against, Indi against the city of Indianapolis he had a group called, uh, I think, Our Something, and, and they were, what was it called? Our Place. And so he was a little testy, but he also became the head of the uh, uh, Fall Creek YMCA. And I came to see John, and he had a, a German Shepherd under his desk, which 
I didn't understand. <laughs> but John was a militant, as you call in those days, and he was the one that caused a lot of the problems, at least challenged the system. And John was a friend of mine, too, by the way. Stay here because you can help answer the questions. So here's someone says, as a 45-year-old with a college education and a desire to invest, how can I be a part of all that is moving forward? That's a great question. How can the average person help? Well, it's, it's complicated. And I think what we did before with Kenneth and uh, Boss Business Opportunity System, we created a vehicle for us to participate in encouraging the city to spend money with black and African-American companies and minority companies. We did, that was part of the emphasis, the major emphasis of everything that went on. And the idea was we would use public money, private money, nonprofit money, and there's a way to do that. The way I learned how to do that was from the Ford Foundation. When I was at the endowment, they sent me out there. I talked to uh, Ron Galt, who had set up LISC, the Local Initiative Support Corporation, which still exists. I learned from LISC. I went to Mississippi to see uh, the uh, Delta Foundation and saw that uh, Charles Bannerman had done this creative thing with businesses and opportunity and the Delta Blues Fest. And that was what the Walker was, was supposed to be. Or partly it became part of that as it produced music and arts and other things. But it was the inspiration of these people that taught us how to do this economic development. You need public money, you need private money, you need nonprofit money, and there's a structure, a way to do that. That's what you have to learn how to do. It still can be done. So, you know, I, th I think I warned everybody that we were not going to get to everything and all the topics. We had lots of questions about unintended consequences. What were the positives? What were the failures? What would people do over? There's so much that we need to talk about. And so I think I'm getting a couple of questions that says some people are disappointed that we didn't get to all of those things. So I will just say, someone said, this is not what I thought it would be because I'm a journalist. I, you know, I like to hear from everybody. What are the negative outcomes, the more the negative outcomes intended or unintended? And then I'm just gonna read a couple of the other questions and if you guys have thoughts, um, says the panelists are not addressing what really happened to the downfall of Indiana Avenue. I don't think that's quite true, but okay. Um, they are talking about the problems that were encountered by the disruption of the Indiana Avenue community and the current revival. And who is downtown for? Interesting question. So who is downtown for? Anybody want to take that? questions you mentioned um mm -hmm. you know it, it's and it, it's an it, it's as someone who moved away from indianapolis in 1970 when i went to college uh, a thousand years ago it has been so amazing to me to see how indianapolis has developed some of the things that that jim was saying um you know, and at the same time, there is there is the law of unintended consequences, breaking up the neighborhoods, with the, what happened with the highway. It scattered people. And so people who had community, there, there's generational trauma around not having community. I'm looking at Charlie Richardson here, who's with a Rethink Coalition. And so there is a lot of work to be done with human capital. And the sense of how do we belong? How do we feel about how we belong? But I have been encouraged uh, in the last few years when I have seen things like butter, like gang gang, I'm, the involvement with the, uh, with the all-stars to see the, some of the younger people on the, you know, they're not young, but they're younger than I am, who really care about culture and who are really interested in economic development. And it's just trying to take hold of it and take ownership of being included, but it has to happen as a partnership. The city has to be involved. The developers have to be involved. The philanthropic community. Kenny? It's been difficult for Indianapolis to, to, to learn and apply as much as is as, as needed. But not only for Indianapolis, it's been for other cities similarly situated. Because how do you create win-win? How do you have win-win situations? Balance benefit. How can Indian Avenue remain what it has been for the African-American community, 
but understanding that it won't be only for the African-American community based upon how Indianapolis is expanding. The challenge is how do you create balanced benefit? And that takes time and that takes effort. And the opposition to that is when people want to do things quick. And when developers call the shots. And this process needs to be done so that not only does it benefit Indian Avenue and Indianapolis, but other cities in this country are looking for the examples of how you have sensitivity and compassion as well as excellence in development. How do you accommodate the different interests and how do you do it in a way that people can be proud of? And I think that is, that's our challenge, but I think we have the resources to be able to do that. But don't look for something quick. Don't look for something easy. Look for the difficult things that's gonna bring the greatest impact and create a legacy that we all can be proud of. Balance benefit. Joe? One of the questions that came forward was uh, what happened in the downfall and they're not talking about problems. I think the major uh, downfall and problems created was the number of people displaced without equity in this community. Uh, while I was uh, deputy mayor, uh, we were going to make plans to bring Interstate 69 all the way down from Castleton through downtown, like 65. And uh, I was to host a community meeting out here on the east side uh, in the Mapleton uh, Fall Creek area. And very quickly, I, I, I felt an urge to call Bear Hudnut and say, this ain't gonna happen. Because I uh, ran into a room full of people who had been displaced from Lockville and Indiana Avenue area who moved out there and were promised this will never happen to you again. And you know what? We didn't talk about doing that again either. But the major thing that happened was all of the community was displaced. Our community network that, that supported the school four, school 40 that fed into Christmas addicts, that was a community. Just like the community I grew up in, in West Virginia. Now, the difference is when, when they planned to put Interstate 64 through our community in Huntington, we had a place at the table and it didn't happen. So my word is as we go forward, I learned something from someone years ago, Tom Benford said, you can't solve any problem without having people at the table who are gonna be affected and people who can do something about it. And that's what happened as the plans were originally being made for the redevelopment of this Northwest quadrant in downtown, we were not at the table. It was only after um, the mayor put together uh, what we quietly called the city committee, with a whole lot of publicity about it, just a few people, Jim was aware of it, oh, but Dr. Frank Lloyd, and all and women, all and, women. Women. And, and state representative Bill Crawford were at the table, and that was the first time people of color were put at the table in that closed door room. And so that's very important to make sure that whatever happens going forward, we have at the table the people who are going to be affected and the people who can do something about it. Okay, so yes. <laughs> and Faye, you were saying who was not in the room? There were no women. Yeah, there were no women involved in the city committee, Jim. <laughs> so this, here's a question that had, there are two questions. Does the city owe the residents of the Avenue area, anything. And I would just, I would sort of expand that. I mean, we focus so much on Indiana Avenue because that's kind of the sexy place to think about. 
but along Northwestern, which is now MLK, my church, Witherspoon Presbyterian Church, hello, Leah, um, was there. And it was now, it's now underneath the highway, Martin, the Martindale area where Eunice grew up. There are neighborhoods across the city that were really destroyed. So what does the city, does somebody who owes something? And that's, that's a question really of reparations. Does anybody want to talk about that? Charles, do you have any thoughts? <laughs> the hard question. <laughs> oh, look, my, my point of view, I'm, I'm, I was born and raised here. I grew up with the, the era, in the era of segregation. Uh, I went to college, became what was called then a, probably a militant, had the Afro, all of that stuff. Because why? My mother and father worked together, worked for 60 years together. I mean, he had a job, she had a job. They both had 30 year careers, working class people. I understand, I understood and I understand that the only way out of uh, uh, where you are, if you want to get a little bit better, is two or three ways, education, uh, employment, uh, opportunity, economic development, business development. Those are the ways out. There's nothing radical about that, but I wanted our community, black people in particular, to get out of the frame of reference of what is a ghetto. I have I never lived in a ghetto. I lived in 3537 Orchard. At that time, it was neat and clean. All the houses were owned by black people, and there was nothing bad about that neighborhood. It was not a ghetto, but it was defined as a ghetto in the city of Indianapolis because it was all black. And that's what the city had thought about. Oh, the, the records are there. Faye has pointed them out. So we've had to deal with all of that. My idea is to do about do things about that are optimistic, that opportunistic, that our community can build if we put the minds together to build something that makes sense. Yes, Indiana Avenue was lost generally. It should look like Mass Avenue now. Those buildings were all torn down. There's nothing up there but one building where the uh, I think the uh, the Vonnegut Center is. That was formerly owned by Peyton Wells, by the way, and he would he developed a business on the avenue. The Peyton Wells uh, company owned that building. Peyton Wells did. There were other businesses there. And my point is it's simple that the opportunities are there, but they don't fall in your lap. It took me years to be able to get to do this stuff. I didn't start out being able to, to respond to how we could deal with youth development in Indianapolis. It took me years to do that. And you mentioned this idea about youth development, CLD. Mel Woods did that at the endowment with Henry. And, and CLD is an example of how we can build community, not just with buildings, but with programs. Our kids need programs and they need them now. They need to know about what happened on the avenue. They need to know about what happened with George McGinnis and Kenny Morgan, great basketball players. All of our history is kind of lost. And this is one of the places I hope it can be restored. Thank you. Kenny? I'm, I, I'm told I have to end this in two minutes. So your thoughts on that question? No, on just does does who owes people from on Indiana Avenue on Northwestern? Does the community, does the city owe people something? Yeah, I think <laughs> the city owes the people something. In 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 what tangible way? You know, I'm I'm not clear how that would be done, but what they owe is not to repeat it, not for it to happen again. Yeah, that's what that's that's the debt that needs to be paid. But be, just one last thing, I, I just want to thank Charles Blair. Charles has been the visionary. He's been the engine, the inspiration for a lot of what you've heard. You know, he's usually in the background and say too much, but he has been a dynamic person that I have had the pleasure of working with. And a lot of what has been accomplished has been because of Charles Blair. And I want to give him a chance. So this has been an incredible just beginning, a catalyst, a start. We need to do this more. Um, we're going to give you some action items. And I still have about 20 questions. But as someone said to me, 
we need to recognize Tom Ridley, 101 years old. I'm sorry, Aaliyah. I'm sorry, I got to. Tom Ridley, when we were at the Walker Building, we had jazz on the avenue. Ridley told me about everything that ever happened on the avenue. I have to say that Roy Stone, all these other people, Penny Morgan, Bernard McCullough, all these people really helped us do this thing. And I just want to acknowledge that fact. What Kenny said was really him. <laughs> he did the work. And he he's he's the guy that I, Kenny's a lawyer, by the way. Not only a preacher, but he's a lawyer. <laughs> yes, that's true. He is, he is, he is all he's a Renaissance man. We have so many questions, but oh. Oh, yes, please. So thank you, thank you, Paula. Everyone who is from the Indiana Avenue neighborhood, please, or yeah, people who have a connection, who are, you know, whose grandparents lived on the avenue, who have any connection, please stand up and show us that you are here. And Paula, of course, has been just a force in making sure that people remember the legacy. Uh, at the action Are the action items going to be posted? Okay, so you wanna put them up now and while we're, okay. So we, the, the committee put together a set of action items. And this is very nice. And these will, and you will, you will get the list and the links if you signed up, huh? I don't know. I, you know, you, that, that, that that's a payback for them women not being in the room. What can I? What can I tell you? <laughs> one, one thing. One okay, thing. go on, go on I Charles. just have to tell you, I've had, I've had some difficulties in my time, and without my family, Margo, who's right there, and my son over there, Chad Blair. Raise your hand, Chad, and his family is. Addison, his daughter, Avery, his, his Avery, by the way, is named after Avery Brooks, who was my best friend. In addition, Avery Brooks was the one that saved the design of the theater. He came in and told us to not to destroy the balcony. Mm -hmm. But the great Avery Brooks from Star Trek D Space okay. Nine and uh, Spencer for Hire, he's my best friend. And he did help save the theater. So I just wanted to say that. Bye, you know, and... family. I love you all. My, my mother in law's <laughs> there, my brother in law, Chad's brother in law. And his wife Danielle, Avery, and Addie. Say hi. They're they're why I'm here. And Margo too. And you know, and it's you look around them, there are so many stories. I mean, like we friendships, family relationships, people who have made a difference. But with all of us in this room together, we really are are leaving with a charge. And here are some action items. And they will be po you will get these these in an email. Go to public meetings and hearings, attend city council meetings or talk with your counselor, attend Department of Metropolitan Development Commission or Board of Zoning Appeals hearings, join indie documenters. Documenters are trained and paid to take notes or live tweets at local public government meetings. And I know I've been seeing some of the, those uh, the reports on Mirror Indie. Stay knowledgeable about new real estate developments. Join your neighborhood association. Subscribe to your local news outlets. And there's a list here that will be sent to you. Indianapolis Recorder, Mirror Indy, Indy Star, Indianapolis Business Journal, Inside Indiana Business, Indy Today, Axios Indiana. So Eunice and I are journalists, as is Charles. So we think it's really important to read these these um, or read these um, media outlets. Uh, educational resources and organizations, Indiana Landmarks Black Heritage Preservation Program at indianalandmarks.org. Er, Marsh urged you to join, I urge you to support it and also the work that Eunice and her team are doing with the Black Heritage Preservation Program. Yes, <laughs> Eunice. <laughs> Reclaim Indiana Avenue at reclaimindianaavenue.org. Uh, Indiana Avenue Certified Strategic Plan. Elizabeth Kennedy is here in the audience. 
the Department of Metropolitan Development and the Mayor's Office are working on this certified strategic plan. The Rethink Coalition, Rethink 65-70-ORG. Indianapolis Urban League, INDPLSUL.org. Hoosier Environmental Council, Environmental Justice Initiative, HECweb.org. Urban Legacy Lands Initiative, ULI1.org. Madam Walker Legacy Center, I see Christian here. Madam Walker Legacy Center.com, Crispus Attics Museum, Crispus Attics Museum.business.site. That's an unusual list. So, action items. We want you to go out of here wanting to continue to educate yourself, wanting to think about how you can make yourself be in the room. Any closing thoughts from anybody? Thank you all very, very much.